Welcome to Understanding WIOA Disability Related Reporting, Tools for Data Visualization. We are so happy that you're here with us today. Today's webinar has two hosting projects. The first is the LEAD Center, which stands for Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. And we are a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, Policy Development Center of the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Social Policy Research Associates and National Disability Institute lead the LEAD Center. Our second host is the Workforce Data Quality Initiative, or WDQI, a project of the Employment and Training Administration. It helps states build better connected data systems to better serve customers. Social Policy Research Associates leads the WDQI project. So that everyone can fully participate in today's webinar, we'd like to take a moment to share some captioning and housekeeping tips. Today's webinar is live captioned. The captions appear below the slide deck. You also have the option to open the captioning webpage in a new browser. The link has been posted in the chat box. You can adjust the background color, text color, and font using the drop down menus at the top of the browser if you choose to personalize your captions. Just position the window to sit on top of the embedded captioning. If you have content questions during this presentation, and we do encourage you to ask them, please type them into the Q&A panel, and we will save time at the end for questions and answers. If your question is not content related, you can just type it in the chat box. And lastly, if you're experiencing technical issues or have questions for the technical support team, open the participants list and select the raise hand button next to your name. To kick off our presentation today, I'd like to welcome Melissa Turner. Melissa is the Director of Special Projects in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP, and she's also the project lead for the LEAD Center. She previously worked on ODEP's employer policy team, leading work with employers to increase recruitment, hiring, retention, and promotion of individuals with disabilities in the workplace. While she was at the Office of Management and Budget, Budget, she developed regulations to protect the rights of individuals with disabilities under WIOA and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Melissa, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Laura. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Understanding WIOA Data-Related Reporting, Disability-Related Reporting, Tools for Data Visualization. I'm Melissa Turner from the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or as we call ourselves, ODEP. ODEP funds the National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities, or LEAD Center, which, as Laura said, is hosting today's webinar along with the uh, WDQI. And they gathered together this excellent group of speakers for today's presentation. ODEP and LEAD are so excited to share the new WIOA data visualization tool with you today. This project really started from a place of curiosity. We wanted to know more about state progress in reporting on the disability data points required under WIOA. We worked with the LEAD Center to analyze the data in the hopes of answering a few key questions. What are states reporting? How much are they reporting? And what stories do these data tell us about the ways that people with disabilities are served by the workforce system? The presenters today will share more about this resource, and we hope you find the tool to be useful and informative as you advance your work on disability inclusion. During today's webinar, we will also be joined by speakers from the Wisconsin Workforce System to discuss effective reporting and analysis of WIOA disability-related data and how it can enhance services and help mitigate job losses for individuals with disabilities. Before I turn it over to our presenters, I want to take this opportunity to let you know about two exciting anniversaries that are happening this year. ODEP is working on a year-long series of events and resources to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, 
which was signed into law in July of 1990. Additionally, this October will mark the 75th anniversary of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM. We invite you to learn more about the ADA and NDEAM during this important year on our website at dol.gov slash ADA30 and dol.gov slash NDEAM. With that, I'll turn it back to Laura to help us dive into today's content. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, what a great introduction. So my name is Laura Aaron. I'm the project manager of the LEAD Center and a senior associate at Social Policy Research Associates, or SPR. Today, you will also hear from Joshua Mallett, SPR senior data programmer, and our special guests from Wisconsin's Department of Workforce Development, Bruce Paulskill, assistant division administrator, and Brian Hipsch, data governance and integration manager. Today, we are excited to share a new online interactive tool that will allow you to explore your disability related WIOA data. Highlight promising practices from the field to help you improve your reporting and ultimately services for people with disabilities and discuss how you can use your data to drive system improvements. One of our goals for this webinar series and really for our larger projects is for states and local areas to know your disability related data. Most states and local areas are not necessarily aware of their data related to customers with disabilities. So we built a tool to easily give you access to your data. Once you see your data, we encourage you to investigate what might be driving your comprehensive or not as comprehensive reporting rate reporting rates. Some things to look at in your investigations could be the training of your staff. Staff understand why we collect disability related data, not just how to input the data. And other avenues of investigation may lead you to your case management system and how customers and staff interact with intake and registration forms and or you may want to look at your current outreach to people with disabilities. Once you, have a better, once you have a better idea of what might be driving your reporting, you can develop a plan at the state and local levels. Bottom line, if staff in the field can better understand who they are serving, their programs can better connect with and serve people with disabilities. I want to share with you um, some of the results of our national data investigation. And basically, it shows that overall, there is low reporting on most disability related data elements. For example, about 74% of participants with disabilities do not indicate their type of disability. Um, there are a few states, though, that have high rates of reporting across most disability related data elements, including Wisconsin, who, as you know, um, are with us today, and they're also with us next week for part two to share their promising practices. Lower disability related reporting rates are likely due to a misunderstanding of what many data elements intend to capture and how these data can help both programs and stakeholders trying to understand the challenges faced by people with disabilities. I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Joshua Mallett, who will show you quite a nifty online data tool. Joshua. Thank you, Laura. Uh, hello, everybody. As Laura said, I'm Joshua Mallett and I'm going to give a nice overview of our interactive data visualization tool that we built to help you explore WIOA reporting disability related data elements. What's a really fantastic aspect of this tool overall is that you'll have the ability to explore these rates within your own states at the county level, as well as across the six ETA regions. 
you've been provided with the link here, which you're welcome to use and explore at any time. This tool is available online, as Laura mentioned. And I'm going to walk through how to use the tool today and all the various tabs and pieces of information that you can explore deeper at your own leisure. So first, let me switch over to the tool. And when you come to the home page of the tool, you'll immediately be presented with a map of the United States. You'll see that the map is broken down um, at the state level, and there's a lot of things to explore here. But first, I'm going to go over the main four tabs that you'll see at the top of the screen that I'm sharing. There's the Welcome tab in the top left corner of your screen, where you're presented with an overview of how the tool works. There's also the Data by Map tab, which you're presented with here, that has four various subtabs that I'm going to go into more detail in a bit that show maps for all of the disability-related items in a variety of ways. There's also the Data by Tables tab, which is not only a fantastic way to get a deeper look at the rates of reporting for all the disability items, as well as the population counts in all of these areas, counties, and regions, but it also allows for a heightened level of accessibility for those who may not be able to view the maps visually. And lastly, we also have the data guide, which I'm going to go into a little detail later as well, where you can explore the 10 disability-related data elements and their definitions and short summary descriptions of what they mean. So I'm going to go back to the data by map tab just to start out to go through each of those sub tabs very briefly to give you an idea of what you can explore here. The immediate tab that you're brought to underneath data by map is the disability status tab. Underneath this tab, as I said before, you're presented with a map of the United States where you can explore the reporting rates at the state level where yellow indicates higher rates of reporting and purple indicates lower rates of reporting. You can see next to the map that there's a legend that provides the range of these rates of reporting, as well as the summary of the overall reporting for the United States across different programs. Additionally, there's the Disability Status by Program tab, where you can explore rates of reporting by programs, including the WIOA Adult Program, the WIOA Dislocated Workers Program, the WIOA Youth Program, and the Wagner, Pizer, and Jobs for Veterans States Grants Program. There's also a really fantastic tab, the new Under WIOA tab, where you're able to view the additional disability-related data elements. As you may have noticed on the first tab, hence its title, Disability Status, you're able to explore the first disability-related data element. This tab allows you to explore the nine additional disability-related elements that are new under WIOA. Again, you can explore these for all states with a legend that reports the yellow shading for higher rates of reporting and purple shading for lower rates of reporting. And lastly, there's also the state comparison tab where you'll be able to compare your state to see if your state has more or less comprehensive reporting compared with the other states in the US on average. Before I go into some of the results that we found um, across some of these tabs, I wanted to talk about each of the disability related Perl data elements very briefly. So again, if you go to the data guide tab, you're able to look at a table of each of the 10 data elements, where in the first column, you can see the name of the data element. In the second column, you can see the definition, as well as a summary description. And so I'm just going to briefly list these elements, and please feel free to explore them. The first data element is individual with a disability. There's also the category of disability for an individual is indicated that they have a disability. You can also look at state developmental disabilities agency services. You can also see the local or state mental health agency services, Medicaid home and community-based services waiver services, whether an individual has indicated their work setting. 
their type of customized employment services received, financial capability, individualized education program, and lastly, the Section 504 plan, whether or not an individual has this or not. So I'm going to move back to the data by map tab and go back to our disability status tab. Now, as I said before, we're seeing a map of the US and at the top of the map, you can see that we have a short summary that describes the overall reporting rate where we see that overall 5.2% of WIOA, Wagner Pizer and JVSG participants have indicated having a disability. The rates of reporting, again, are shown in purple and yellow, where yellow is indicating the higher rates of reporting. You can see here as well that on their left, you can search any of the individual states where you want to investigate the reporting in your state at the county level to better understand the rates of reporting within your state. I'm just going to type in an example. You can type in the state abbreviation or the full state name. And when you type that in, the map will update below and you can see your state rates of reporting at the county level. So for example, here you can see that Idaho reports 13.1% of WIOA, Wagner Pizer, JVSG participants indicating having a disability. I'm going to scroll back up here because an important part about this tab is not only that you can explore the reporting rates of participants who have indicated they have a disability, but also understanding what that means, as well as what it means when an individual does not report their disability status. We have a nice graphic here where we just wanted to explain a little deeper what this means. So, as you know, when you report your disability status, when a participant reports this, they can indicate that yes, they have a disability, or they can indicate no, they do not have a disability. But there is also an option for the participant to not indicate whether or not they have a disability or they do not have a disability. And this is something that our online data visualization tool explores for several of these disability items to better help us understand where reporting rates are far lower. And again, this can be seen across the US. So I'm going to go back to our tool here. And you can see on the left side of the map, there's a filter view by area. This is the area where, again, you can not only explore at the state level, but you can also explore at the ETA region level. And by selecting under the disability status selection, you can switch the map to now explore the reporting rates where individuals have not indicated whether or not they have a disability. In other words, the participant's disability status is unknown. The overall summary at the top of the map is updated to indicate that 11.5% of WIOA, Wagner Pizer, and JVSG participants' disability status is unknown. And again, we can see these reporting rates. One thing to note is that while we've changed what the information that we're looking at, that yellow shading still indicates higher rates of reporting. And so here we can see when purple shading is indicate, indicating lower rates of reporting. And again, you can explore any of the states at the county level. We also wanted to show reporting at the program level. As I stated before, you can explore this in the tool, and we provided you here with a table that breaks down the reporting rates for individuals who've indicated they have a disability across each of the main programs in the tool, as well as the percentage reporting rates for those not indicating their disability status. While you can see that the reporting rates for the WIO Adult Program, Dislocated Worker Program, and Wagner Pizer JVSG programs have higher rates of individuals not indicating their disability status, you might also note that the youth program has a lower rate of individuals not indicating their disability status. One last thing we'd like to note as well 
that some of you may know that participant counts may overlap as some participants are co-enrolled in more than one program. Again, this information can be explored in the tool by going over to the disability status by program, where you can look at each of the individual maps for each of these programs and explore them side by side. Lastly, I wanted to take a look at our new under WIOA tab, because this is a particularly important tab that explores each of the nine new disability related items. Again, you can see on the left filter view by, you're not only able to change the type of map you're looking at, but you can also look at each of the nine disability related elements beyond the individual's disability status. When you're first brought to this map, you can see the category of disability that's been indicated by a participant who has already indicated that they have a disability. As Laura mentioned earlier, 73.7% of WIOA, Wagner Pizer, and JVSG participants have not indicated their category of disability. And this is another way to help us better understand what reporting rates look like in the US. And again, any of these additional items can be explored by selecting them on the left side of the map. So once again, we wanted to provide you with the link to this online data tool that you can access at any time so that you can better understand how comprehensive your reporting is. And we hope you find this very helpful in investigating the reporting rates in your state. Laura, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you, Joshua. It certainly is opening when you see your own data. And hopefully it will propel state and local staff to replicate promising practices they see in their own state as they investigate their data and also diagnose what might be happening if the data is not as comprehensive as it could be. We now turn to our colleagues at the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development to share their promising practices related to disability related reporting and improving services for people with disabilities. I'll turn it over to Bruce Paulskill. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, before I turn it over to our colleague, Brian, I wanted to just sort of paint the landscape of Wisconsin a little bit about our partnerships and our job center structure, and that helps guide or influence the presentation that Brian will be doing. Wisconsin has been doing our integrated job centers uh, for over 30 years in most areas of our state. And with, a, with key partners as part of our system and more partners coming al along the way to join is within these integrated uh, locations. I think that's a, a critical piece because we've had a long-standing um, situation where both customers and our partners are just used to working together, collaborating on referrals, collaborating on intake, collaborating on uh, cross-training of the programs, the partner programs uh, between the titles. Uh, in Wisconsin, our WIOA state plan, we have the traditional four titles plus JBSG and TAA, and we are very happy that this year we've added on the TANF food share and reentry programs. And uh, long before those three programs have joined us, we've had a long history of collaboration with them as well. We don't have everything in one reporting system. However, we do have a uh, very good uh, co collaboration going on amongst them. So I think some of the key things I just wanted to share is that uh, th this this world of partnerships takes a long time, but it's we see that it pays off in our trust with our customers. They they It's all they've known with our job center system now for their better part of three decades. It's coming in and knowing that there are a bunch of agencies working together under one roof, trying to trying to avoid duplication of service, trying to figure out what are the right services that our customers need, including those with disabilities, and uh, really trying to um, have our job centers be as effective as they can be. So, we're, so we're very proud of our job center system, and we're very proud of our uh, integration that we have amongst the, the partners. Uh, very similar, I'm sure, to what the experience is in many states, but uh, it's something that. Uh, 
we've worked on for a very, very long time. Uh, so I, with that, I want to turn it over to Brian Hip. She is our uh, lead presenter today that's going to walk through uh, a lot of the slides that you're now going to see about the data that he's presenting for the state of Wisconsin. So Brian, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Bruce. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Hipsch. Over the previous six years, I have worked with WIOA performance and reporting. Our state agency has been on a journey to evolve its data collection strategy from one of just meeting performance measures to uh, actually build evidence building activities. Nobody woke up in 2014 following the enactment of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act in Wisconsin and said, Wisconsin is gonna be lights out at reporting data elements regarding disability. Instead, we thought we needed to take the data collection processes uh, to provide more value to the customers who receive our services. That's where we focused. That work continues today uh, despite my reassignment to a more global data management position in the department. One of the beliefs was to provide the context behind asking the questions that comprise the participant individual record re uh, layout, also known as the PERL or the federal uh, data collection requirements. The required collection um, that must be asked, asked of our participants is vast. Uh, we were concerned about uh, first receiving truthful responses, and then second, uh, the impact and the potential for decreased staff morale. Staff do not enjoy entering data into a computer system. It's not why they signed up to work with us. Um, this dissatisfaction is often is exasperated when staff do not perceive there is a good purpose to collecting that information. So I believe there are two ways to get a person to answer any question truthfully and completely. First, provide the context for the collection. And second, trust the answer will not be used inappropriately. This additional information provides purpose, whether the staff or uh, the customers agreed with the purpose. It forms uh, a type of legitimacy uh, instead of leaving the client uh, or customer to wonder what the government is doing with my data. Next slide, please. I do not have any proven explanations why Wisconsin customers answer uh, these questions at greater rates than other states. Uh, after initial discussions uh, with uh, social policy research, our state learned that all the common sense things, such as making the fields mandatory in the system, were not unique to Wisconsin. There must be another explanation. So I'm going to provide an approach and a way of thinking that has been gaining traction within Wisconsin's Department of Workforce Development and our workforce system in general. The approach is increasing the importance of data management concepts, such as data governance and data stewardship. If you read a lot of books, you may become smart and uh, well-educated in something. If you are a football team and you practice tackling a lot, you might end up having a good defense. So if we have good data management practices, we may be good at reporting disability-related dis data, despite not uh, deliberately focusing on that specific goal. The WIOA partner programs in Wisconsin have developed an integrated service delivery governance structure that is focused on driving integrated activities between the WIOA programs. This structure developed recently in 2017. The state also received a Workforce Data Quality Initiative or WDQI grant round seven, uh, during round seven, that is designed to build the governance structure and data sharing capabilities to help WIOA and many other workforce programs in the state to meet their re evaluation requirements. These newer structures and initiatives uh, are designed uh, for the department and its 
partners um, to be set up for long-term success in collecting and using data. Next slide, please. There are obvious benefits for workforce providers when complete data is collected. These benefits provide the motivation for the providers, whether they are local workforce board contractors, uh, our department's Bureau of Job Service or Office of Veterans Employment Services to assist workforce clients best to provide this information. When reviewing paper applications, our staff assist by explaining the purposes for and reassure them that their data is secure. Um, this is also highlighted in many of our release of information that uh, our clients must sign. I will highlight um, the impacts of uh, the statistical adjustment model on the performance goals at the end of the year in another webinar. Um, I believe our state was successful in messaging to workforce provider how important reporting all of the characteristics of the participants served and uh, how the economic conditions impact the end of year adjustments uh, that are mandated under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act performance accountability provisions. Additionally, the state and local areas benefit by enhancing their evidence-based activities uh, by having enough and accurate data. It increases the effectiveness of research and evaluation activities that can be done. Operational reporting also tells providers information about the scope of their activities. Everybody likes to get good feedback about what they are doing. Whether it's a scoreboard uh, of your favorite football team, your report card in school, or information about uh, something else you have interested in, everybody likes to see good positive feedback. Uh, this is no different um, in, in the, for our workforce providers. And additionally, uh, those who wish to excel, they don't mind finding out if there are some of those opportunities to improve. These are all motivations to collect data completely and accurately. Next slide, please. I alluded to this earlier, uh, but it is important to let customers know why we collect all of this data. Uh, beyond the obvious reason, um, because it allows them to access program services and it's a requirement, the customers who access, access our system benefit from having informed staff who work with them and can work with them from a position of uh, just being informed about them, uh, about the customers. This first bullet leads to the next three, which are all good for the customer. Informed career planners can do a better job of assisting the customer on their journey to appropriate employment opportunities. There is more flexibility to inform co-enrollment opportunities that have maximum resources to uh, meet the highest number of needs the customer has. Lastly, customers enjoy informed referrals because nobody wants the runaround of an un, un, inappropriate referral. Inappropriate referrals are frustrating to the customer and make the staff in the workforce system look disingenuous and not knowledgeable. Our data steward team did some training in a, a common intake project about a generic customer named Jordan who experienced both appropriate and inappropriate referrals. It was kind of like a choose your own adventure book. The range of emotions Jordan experienced were from extreme relief that she was receiving assistance to extreme frustrations from an unproductive day at the job center. That's the training we gave uh, a number of staff um, to help illustrate why the importance of um, informed referrals um, and how that impacted our customers. Next slide, please. Employers also benefit from this information. However, I want to point out that employers would never receive this aggregate information from our programs for any customer. The workforce system models behavior that is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, Employers also benefit because uh, the workforce system assists employers by showing them how they can meet the, their critical workforce needs by hiring individuals with a disability. The business service teams are trained to help alleviate concerns uh, employers have uh, regarding uh, you know, individuals with disabilities and, and how that may impact their operations. All of this, these efforts lead 
uh, to improve employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities while meeting business talent needs, which ultimately help meet the needs of our state's economy. Next slide, please. Wisconsin has integrated American Job Centers. This enables good communication between programs and partners. The state's labor market exchange, the jobcenteroflisconsin.com website is often the first or the point of entry for most customers who seek our program services. The initial registration questions on JCW are standardized to meet the reportable individual requirements set out by the United States Department of Labor. Additionally, the Reemployment Services and Eligibility Assessment Program, also known as RESCA, has an online questionnaire for all of its participants. The RESCA program has been fully integrated with the WIOA Title III Wagner Pizer Employment Services program for many years now. The same agency, the same people, the same data collection system. The disability related data elements are on the RESCA questionnaire and get collected into the intake of RESCA and are immediately shared with the Title III program. The Title III Wagner Pizer and RESCA programs typically have the largest volume of customers in our system. Let's go to the next slide, please. Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin's Vocational Rehabilitation Program is in the Job Center and at the table uh, in the one-stop operating system. Uh, similarly, there is part to the uh, employment training programs, there is participation in statewide committees and executive teams by the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Management. Uh, DVR has been a great partner because of the programming and staff experience it has brought to Wisconsin's public workforce system. Although we do not have um, a real-time data sharing uh, with uh, the, the Voc Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, having their presence um, and helping in informing a lot of the activities of the employment training uh, program, uh, we find that very beneficial. Next slide, please. The programs integrate and coordinate their activities in the job center so that they can most effectively leverage the resources available uh, to maximize customer benefit. That uh, the I word can be very scary for many workforce programs. Um, and, and we believe this is due, often due to misperception. Uh, we integrate the program activities with each other. When our programs work together, the common customer wins. Program coordination and integration is done well since many employment training programs already use the asset system. The information source is the same for uh, these programs uh, that I will show you on the next slide, please. The Division of Employment Training, which administers the WIOA Title I, III, and Wagner Pizer uh, Jobs for Veterans State Grant and other state programs has an integrated application to collect participant data. Uh, the automated system support for employment training, also known as ASSET, has been in place since 2003. Uh, 2003. Initially, it was specifically built to meet federal reporting requirements of the Workforce Investment Act of 1998 program. As a growing desire to know what was happening in the programs, and the evidence-based movement, ASSET was and is continued to be asked to do more and for more programs. The system integrated more federal programs during the transition from WIA to WIOA. Recently, the trend has been to put more state-specific programs into ASSET to uh, first avoid the costs of having independent an independent application and all of its unique costs but second, to also improve the integration between the other programs and the coordination. The Wisconsin Summer Youth Program is funded by a provision in state statute. Uh, there are several programs that grew up in separate systems but are uh, becoming more integrated through projects uh, such as the Integrated Service Delivery Project I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Even before the pandemic, communication with staff was primarily done through webinars. 
consistent messaging regarding data handling and performance topics uh, were delivered through the WIOA Performance Friday webinars. In addition, DWD created content-specific video tutorials that can be accessed by any time, uh, at any time by staff whenever it is convenient for them. Webinars ended up getting, uh, became a gift that keeps on giving as it was a venue to help develop an understanding among staff and could be used in multiple times in multiple venues. You can see a few of the topics that are routinely addressed with staff on this slide. I will highlight the case management system changes uh, that uh, were frequent following the introduction of WIOA. Um, those changes were made to comply with new and modified reporting requirements. It is easy to confuse staff members when the system they log into every day is being updated in an incremental fashion. So timely communication was necessary to assist staff to stay on top of uh, their management system. These webinars happen two times a month and are recorded for future use, use in technical assistance visit and on demand by staff. Next slide, please. This slide talks about some of the topics that were recently delivered and are directly re uh, relevant to today's discussion. Training specific to equal opportunity, non-discrimination and confidenti confidentiality have some impact on serving and collecting data from individuals with disabilities. Uh, the disability related reporting was covered in one of the uh, earlier webinars. Um, also often business services are discussed with materials from that are uh, come from the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, so the webinar series has provided uh, presentations to the business services team to help uh, the business services to individuals with disabilities. So it's a, it's a very diverse webinar series um, that's designed to help out on a lot of things that can contribute to increased um, and improved reporting. Next slide, please. The targeted outreach is informed by data on which uh, areas may have uh, potential workforce and potential you know, employers uh, that can help support uh, the state goals uh, for, the, for the department. Uh, labor market information from wisconomy.com, that's our website uh, where uh, labor market information lives. Uh, information is used by state and local program administrators to develop and form strategies uh, in their workforce plans. The plans emphasize activities and partnerships that assist in serving those with employment influencers. That's what we call them. WIOA calls them the barriers to employment. Um, these relationships um, between the programs help streamline the activities uh, to the individuals with uh, barriers to employment or uh, with, uh, with disabilities and the other uh, employment influencers, as I mentioned. Let's, next slide, please. American Job Centers uh, put out flyers and social media messages about once per month on how the system can help potential customers gain employment. The flyers are often tailored to specific populations, such as individuals with disabilities and veterans and, and veterans with disabilities. Uh, the flyers are often tailored to, um, or I'm sorry, the, the one-stop partners uh, collaborate to host job fairs that invite employers um, and uh, oftentimes they are able to hire people with disabilities. Uh, these programs post these messages to social media uh, and that in order to promulgate a lot of these opportunities to the public, as well as um, on their on the main website, the dwd.wisconsin.gov. Next slide, please. The main digital resource that enhances outreach uh, is the Job Center of Wisconsin. Uh, all uh, of the OneSOP partners use JCW in some form to assist customers uh, in their job search in their areas. Additionally, widgets have been incorporated to assist customers learn more about the labor market and to provide additional resources to help customers improve their skills. Additionally, there are partnerships locally with agencies who all work to improve employment prospects for individuals with disabilities. And in the slide, you can actually collect, uh, or you can click on some of those um, highlighted partnerships. As I mentioned earlier, the results for the state and reporting disability information can mostly be attributed to quality data practices, partnerships in the job center, and effective outreach. 
I hope our presentation helped spark some ideas about how to engage and thoroughly report on individuals with disabilities. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Brian, for sharing your promising practices and how they benefit customers with disabilities, employers, local areas, and your state. If you have questions for either Joshua um, or Brian, please put them in the Q&A panel and we'll get there shortly. Um, just wanna share that, of course, after the webinar, we really encourage everyone to play with the online data visualization tool. Um, that link is in the chat. We'll put that in the chat again. It's also here in the resources that will be posted on the website later. And also for more information on the status of disability-related reporting nationwide, you can access a five-page brief on the Lead Center website. And now we're going to turn to questions and answers. And so far we have a couple questions uh, for Joshua and a couple of questions for Brian. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, Joshua, we're going to start with a couple of uh, questions for you. Um, one uh, guest would like to know how recent the data is on the tool. Um, and if there's a lag, and I'll just add about when it will be updated. Josh. Hi, Laura, thanks. Um, so yeah, we actually list uh, the dates for uh, when, when the data, or what data that we're using. And so uh, this, these curl data are from July 2016 to April 2019. Um, for, the, for each of the quarters in those periods. Uh, and I think, Laura, you, you said you were going to mention when we're updating this data. <laughs> okay, you'll turn that back to me. Um, <laughs> that's good. That's, thanks for that question. Yes, we um, want to update the data, and that's just in process, and we hope to update it every quarter. But you're correct that just as you, um, you know, this data is going to have a quarter lag, um, because, you know, it comes from the states and then is cleaned and then we'll, we'll be able to update the data. So thank you so much for that question. And Joshua, while I, ha while I have you, I'd like to ask uh, one other question that came in from our guests. Um, it asked, can you say more about how and where the data points are collected? Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, beyond that the, that the data is coming through in the Perl. Um, so, each of these elements uh, are, are items that are um, asked of participants. The data are recorded uh, into the WIP system, and, uh, and then these data are um, aggregated and reported here. Um, so, these are specifically 10. Uh, variables in the Perl system that we're reporting, uh, and they're reported at um, and they're reported at the individual participant level, and so we're then, as Laura mentioned, cleaning these data um, to aggregate them and report them at the county, state, and ETA region. Level. I hope that. Yeah, thanks, Joshua. And I think just for lay people to know that case management systems um, coordinate with these you know, people are throwing around this word Perl. Um, with Perl and WIPs, you don't need to know any of those names right now, but basically um, when, when case managers are entering data, um, all of that data that, that you enter, um, it corresponds with the kind of official data reporting system for the Department of Labor. And, um, and so that data is, um, regularly sent um, by your state. I'm going to move now to a couple, and please keep, keep if, and if we haven't answered your question, go ahead and um, ask again in the Q&A panel. I uh, hope, we, hope we covered that. Brian, I'd like to turn to you. There are several questions for you. Um, the first, does your state require a response to all of the disability data elements 
once they indicate they have a disability. We require a response, but the values are yes, no, and no response, which, um, or um, also known as the individual does not have to disclose. So, um, because this is all voluntary collection, um, we do require a field to be, ent uh, a response to be entered, but there can also be the, we, the participant did want, not want to disclose to us. That's great. Um, and it's a great question. We have another question for you, Brian. Someone asks, what size staff do you have in Wisconsin to support all of these performance related functions? Until about a year ago, um, we had one business staff that would have been me. Uh, now we have um, two or, or one and a half. Um, um, I know Mr. Jeff Orr has two jobs. And um, on the IT side, there was a uh, project manager um, in the division of employment training and then a few um, uh, the de developers who would work on this. So it, it, it isn't that we have a lot of people who are dedicated to this. Uh, the idea was that we would, you know, utilize um, the, the staff that are either in the job center or in, in the program areas um, by bringing them up to speed on many of these performance concepts so that it would make it more manageable that we only had a few people um, in our uh, state that were working on this, that this was more of a, a language, uh, more like a uh, data as a second language kind of uh, deal so that we wouldn't have to rely on one or two people to do everything. Thank you, Brian. And I think you've answered um, the next person part of their question because she wanted to know, um, you know, how you're organized, right? And you've answered that it's now about one and a half people you know, at the state level. Um, but she, she asked further, she asked how many people are working on performance data, but then she further asked how many people are working on technical assistance and outreach? Is that another team? So outreach, I, that, that's a hard question for me because a lot of our outreach is done locally um, yes. and in coordination with many of the partners. And so that um, I, I don't have a great answer for that. Technical assistance, uh, we do have a number of uh, people who work on technical assistance. So if, uh, the, the one and a half, uh, Mr. Aaron Sarbacher, who is, is my re uh, superior replacement. And then uh, uh, Jeff, they do performance technical assistance. However, there is another program section in WIOA that provides that technical assistance to the Title I programs. Um, additionally, in the Bureau of Job Service, they have, uh, I, I, I know of a few people that do technical assistance and training for the RESCA and the Title III Wagner Pizer program. Uh, and then our, in uh, uh, some of our other programs, they have one or two people at the state office who work on uh, training uh, for Jobs for Veterans State Grant. And, and I know in the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, one of our partners, they have um, a policy committee that does webinars. So. Um, we don't, it wouldn't be, you know, just one or two people doing all of this technical assistance. It's really spread out um, across the different program areas. Thanks, Brian. And um, again, uh, thanks everyone for your questions. You still have a little time to get your questions in. Go ahead and put those in the Q&A panel. Um, if you have questions about the tool, uh, the online tool or questions for Brian, um, you know, at the state level, um, or he might have information about at the local level, you know, but what we're really hearing from Brian is kind of consistent messaging. And um, how that's happened is as Bruce first explained about really working on system integration um, and having all programs be able to share consistent messaging and down to being able to, um, regularly train your staff. And again, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning as to why <laughs> you're even collecting this data and not just how you're collecting this data. As you know, a lot, a lot of states and local areas do trainings on here's how you input this, you know, into the system. Um, and 
uh, but not necessarily why. And as Brian has said, you know, everyone wants to know why, what's in it for me? You know, no, no matter who you are, whether you're a customer, a staff member, um, an employer. And so as you work in the field, you know, really think about that. Think about who the different customers are that you serve, including yourselves, and say, well, how do we motivate um, folks? And, um, and, you know, Brian really shared that also. So, uh, Josh, I'm going to have you go to the next slide. Um, if any last minute questions come in, we'll, we'll answer them. But I just wanted to give a plug for next week's webinar. Um, we hope to see you here. It's kind of the same time. And it's part two of this wheel reporting series. When we get into the nitty gritty of the participant individual record layout or PERL. And so we'll go each through each of those 10 data elements that Joshua was sharing and talk about, well, what does it mean state, de for, for example, state developmental disability services? What does that even mean? And what does it mean, you know, what are the responses and what does that mean? Um, so that you're able to provide um, better technical assistance to your field. I've just put the link in to register for next week's webinar um, in case you still need to do that. And Joshua, next slide. Um, if you're not already connected um, to the LEAD Center, we would love um, to have you connect with us and sign up to get newsletters and notifications. Next slide. And also, we'd like you to follow the Workforce Data Quality Initiative, building connected data systems that help us work smarter and deliver for customers. Next slide. So also for WDQI, you can sign up to get their newsletter and sign up to hear their podcasts, which is super interesting. I don't see any additional questions for our panelists today. And so I'm going to thank you for attending today's webinar. And we really look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.